All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pankaj, uh, and especially thank you for arranging this uh, virtual meeting. Uh, some of you may know in past ONS meetings in New York, I've usually talked about problems and not solutions. Um, thanks to Ed Schneibel, who's often recorded those, uh, the talks went online. And frankly, I've had some good feedback from members who saw it from around the world. So in the same vein, today I'd like to pose the question as to how we are to interpret medieval India's posthumous coins. Uh, at the risk of banality, um, posthumous is defined according to the Oxford Dictionary, meaning something happening or done or published after a person has died. In numismatics, uh, some very common examples of posthumous coins might be the Maria Teresa Tallers dated 1780, or perhaps Indian princely states uh, who issued coins in the name of long deceased Mughal emperors. And of course, there's lots more examples than that. What I'd like to discuss today, uh, the posthumous possibility I'd like to raise with you involves North India's seated Lakshmi gold coinage of the 11th through the early 13th centuries. And there's a, a good example pictured here. First, uh, it might be a good idea to define some of the reasons that a coin would be issued posthumously. And I'm starting with the example of the Maria Teresa Tallers. These by definition, of course, are all posthumous as that was the year of the Empress's death. The Taller was initially part of a massive minting of silver crowns for use in Europe's Levantine trade. The image of the young goddess started years previously. Here's Austria in 1765. Um, and it became a talisman to Middle Eastern businesses. In other words, it was highly recognized. As a result, the Austrian taller was copied by other 18th century trading states. Here you have Venice in 1781, and you'll see the similarity of the portrayal. Uh, Ragusa, 1794, Ragusa being a major trading state like Venice on the Adriatic Sea, and once again, the portrait evolving, and even into the 20th century, uh, those of you who follow such things will recognize the Eritrea Tolero that Italy issued um, in 1918. So the 1780 was simply uh, part of a, a longer trend that had started already. The use of the Maria Teresa Taller spread rapidly into Arabia, the Red Sea, Ethiopia, Eritrea, down the African coast to Zanzibar, Madagascar, and Mozambique. In countries that had no currency of their own, like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Ethiopia, the Taller survived into the 20th century. It was still legal in Muscat and Oman in 1970. And of course, the factors that made it so uh, acceptable, whereas recognizability, it's a reliable bullion value, and um, the fact that it was uh, simply accepted. During the Second World War, uh, almost all of the protagonists used the um, Maria Tusa Taller. It was struck between 36 and 42 in Vienna, Rome, London, Paris, Brussels, and even Bombay as late as 1942. So here's a case of consumer press users preferred and users being bankers and businesses throughout the region. They trusted the money form and they preferred it over others. Similarly, I mentioned the posthumous coin phenomena closer to home for India Wallace the use by Indian princely states of the names and titles of long dead Mughal emperors on their coins, well into the late 19th century. Now Sanjay Garg 
has written extensively on this tug of war between the imperial authorities who were keen to promote the use of the universal rupee coinage portraying Queen Victoria and the princely states, uh, which were keen to maintain their time-honored forms of coinage dating back to Alamgir II, Shah Alam II, and Muhammad Akbar Shah. And I've shown here just one of many, many, many. This is uh, from Gwalior State, uh, Jain Mint. The rupee is actually dated in Hijri 1314, which is about 1896, remembering that it's in the name of Shah Alam who died uh, 90 years previously in 1806. What was the reason for this? Well, on one hand, it clearly was an instance where customer preference for long familiar forms was a factor. But Garg maintains that the overwhelming factor at work here was the desire of the princely states to safeguard and to continue exercising their minting prerogatives originally granted by the Mughal emperor. Part of this was status. But part of it, of course, was also the fact that there was a profit accruing from the minting process itself. So how do these cases inform the earlier situation in medieval India? Well, there seem to have been two situations with the seated Lakshmi coins. Some series of these coins were dynastic. That is, the coins reflected the succession of kings. And the best example is the coinage of the Chandelas of Mahoba and Madhya Pradesh, who issued seated Lakshmi coins in the name of Kirti Varman, shown here, Selakshana Varman, Jaya Varman, Madana Varman, Parmardi Varman, Trilokya Varman, Vira Varman, as you can see over uh, 150 years. Clearly, this was a closely regulated minting process, which was under close royal supervision. However, while there are many cataloged seeded Lakshmi varieties, and we just seed some, probably 90% of all surviving specimens of this coin type are in the name of only two kings, either Gangeya Deva or Govinda Chandra. To illustrate this situation, I, I show an auction lot here in which the individual coins are not uh, individually identified, although we can see that they're Govinda Chandra. This map shows that the Chandelas that we've just looked at, mentioned in the earlier slide, were sandwiched between two rival kingdoms, the Kalachuris in the south, and the Gaharlavadas in the north. Gangeya Deva, who ruled from about 1015 to 1040, was head of the Kalachuri family, ruling Chedi or Dahala in central India. His capital, shown here, was Tripuri on the Narmada River near modern Jabalpur. A seated Lakshmi coin was issued in his name, shown here on the bottom right. This is considered the prototype of the entire series. Govinda Chandra, who ruled from 1114 to 1154, in other words, a century later, was head of the Gaharavala family in Majadesha, the former Pratihara realm, now modern Uttar Pradesh. A seated Lakshmi coin was issued in his name as well, which is shown here at the top. Now it's worth remembering that neither of these persons were the proto-dynastic founder of their lineage. They were the kings whose names appeared on the coins of the kingdom. Gangeya Deva coins come in a number of varieties, defined by both subjectively and objectively. The subjective points are uh, a variety of physical uh, details, which I show here. Um, on this slide, we see some of the main telltales found on the Gangeya Deva coins. 
if you look at the first three here, you'll see the uh, word Shri. On the very, very earliest, the Shri is looped and closed. On the much more numerous uh, and slightly cruder uh, coins, the Shri is unlooped and open. I call this the plain Shri. And another variety has a small dot here, which seems to be minor, but it is very consistent throughout the entire period, and we'll see it again. So this is the dotted Shri. Another difference is in the goddess's face. Uh, uh, on one variety, you can see all the features of the face. On another, it's blank. Not because it's unstruck, but simply because nothing was engraved. If we go down to the girdle below the uh, belly of the goddess, on some of the coins, there are consistently six beads. On others, there are consistently seven beads. If we look at the bottom left here, you'll see uh, the Padmasana uh, goddess. Uh, on some has the right leg up. On others, she has the right leg down. And in examples far too many to mention, in order to show here, there are random dots in the field which have nothing to do with the message itself. They're not part of the uh, diacriticals. I don't show a chart of objective comparison, but these are the metallic content of the coins, which range from 90% at the high end to 5% at the low end. Also, the patterns of metrology weights are compared to design features, and there'll be more of this later. Now, given all these changes, McDowell argued that on the basis of comparative fabric, the Gangea Deva coins were issued not only during his reign, but long after. So he raised the possibility of posthumous status for some of the coins. There have been objections to this. P.C. Roy thought that all types could be accommodated within the day of his reign. But I think just on the basis of what we've seen on this one slide, we recognize that there are so many major varieties that this interpretation is probably difficult to sustain. I haven't prepared a separate slide for Govinda Chandra, but by and large, what we see on this Gangeya Deva slide pertains as well to Govinda Chandra, which is uh, a singular fact in itself. Now, considering that there is a, a, a putative century or so between the two issues, if we simply take the dates of the kings, the fact that there were so many similarities has raised a red flag that eventually led to an interpretive breakthrough. I will show that here. The question of the period of issue of the Govinda Chandra coins has not been much discussed, as most numismatists assumed they were lifetime issues, that is to say, from 1114 to 1154. The credit for raising the question of the posthumous nature of the Govinda Chandra coins and linking them to the Gangeya Deva predecessors goes to a researcher named Biswajit Rat from the Nasik Institute, who in a detailed argue, article uh, examining the Dalmau court, suggested that the seated Lakshmi coins of Gangeya Deva and Govinda, Tranj, Govinda Chandra, excuse me, formed a continuous succession, finally terminating with the seated Lakshmi coins in the name of Muhammad bin Sam. Uh, dated uh, in India uh, from 1194 to 1210. I picture here all the main points of his argument. Rutt believes that the coins showed a continuous production from about 1015 to 1210, i.e. almost two centuries. So in his view, both Gangeya Deva and Govinda Chandra coins were initiated during the lives of their namesakes, but continued in production for many decades later. So unlike the contemporary Chandela coins, 
they were not dynastic at all, but continued to be issued during the reign of successor kings bearing the original names. Having a look at this, and starting with Gangea David coins, putting aside the early very fine fabric, good gold specimens, and we'll focus on the much more numerous Kruger specimens. They fall into two classes, which I've arranged uh, vertically here. The most consistent telltale or marker of the two classes, ironically, is the letter of the Akshara Shri, the plain one forming the first class and the dotted Shri forming the second class, regardless of issuer. In Gangea Davis coins, it's noticed that the same varieties occur as, excuse me, the Govinda Chandra coins and Gangea Davis coins. Uh, there is a difference that happened during this reign, and you will notice that the plain Shri coins continued the same metrology as they had earlier, but the dotted Shri coins during the reign of Govinda Chandra became significantly heavier by some 10%. Finally, Rutt mentions, but he did not illustrate, the carrying over of some of these characteristics into the Muhammad bin Sam coins, which I picture here at the bottom. We see here the maintenance of the two classes, plain Shri, dotted Shri, plain Shri on Muhammad Sam, dotted Shri as well, and the continuation of the two weight standards, including the change in weight in the dotted Shri that you can see here. Look at the coins closely. A highly stylized depiction of the goddess has barely changed over two centuries. The main design elements re remain constant. Likewise, the layout of the legend remained the same despite the change of names. Note not only the similarity in the form of Shri, but the strong comparison between the Ma Akshara in all of the examples. Quite characteristic and quite different than the Paramara or Chandala coins of the same period. So both fabric and metrology suggest a continuity in the production of Gangeya Deva, Provinja Chandra, Mohammed bin Sam, seated Lakshmi coins. If we look at the pattern of coin circulation, the meaning of this observation begins to emerge. As is to be expected, Gangea Deva coins have a strong presence in the re region around Tripudi, the Kalachuri homeland. This is most noticeable in the earliest, the very, very fine fabric coins I was mentioning, probably made during Gangea Deva's lifetime, that is to say the early 11th century as well as a type of very peculiar silver colored coins, probably produced very late in the 13th century and uh, of very low gold content, typically found in the region of Tripoli. But the hoard record also shows a very strong distribution of Gangea Deva coins into the Gangea Valley as well and they almost exclusively tend to be the cruder type. If we delve into the epigraphs and other sources, we learn that Gagea Deva was a particularly successful warrior, expanding the Kalachuri realm in all directions, but most notably into the former homelands of the Pratihara Empire, capturing both Prayag, which is modern Allahabad, and Kashi, which of course is modern Varanasi. Indeed, on his death, Gangeya Deva's Samadhi was at Prayag, and his son Lakshmi Karna issued grants in the Banaras region soon after succeeding to the throne in 1055. So the Kalachuri kingdom expanded beyond its homeland into the Ganges Basin. This northern expansion, I think, is reflected in the pattern 
of the Gangea Deva Horde finds in Uttar Pradesh. Given the sharp similarities with succeeding coins noted above, it's likely these coins were produced here rather than brought here. Not unexpectedly, since the succeeding Gaharvalas were a local family, the Govinda Chandra coins also show a similar pattern of circulation in the Uttar Pradesh region. Although historians archaically insist on calling the dynasty uh, the rulers of Kanoj, the pattern of copper plate grants shows that they were most active around Kashi and Prayag, and that those two centers comprised the homelands of the Gaharvalas. Not surprisingly, since in addition to the status accruing to the guardians of the two sacred sites, there was undoubtedly an immense profit to be had from regulating the pilgrim traffic to Prayag for the Kumbha Mela and to Kashi for the religious rites of passage. Taking all this information together, it begins to appear that the major area of production and circulation of seated Lakshmi coins from sometime in the reign of Gangeya Deva, which is to say, well after 1015, to the succession of Govinda Chandra, until the conquest of Prayag and Banaras by the Gurids in 1194, was just here, the Ganjiri Cardlands. More precisely, based on typology, we see there were two major mints in operation in the area that produced highly recognizable variants of the seated Lakshmi coins over many generations. Now it's worth remarking that the Gaharavalas wrested control of Banaras from the Kalachuris in 1090. That is to say almost 25 years before Govinda Chandra assumed the throne. Yet there are no coins of his predecessors. So it seems likely that the Gangeya Deva coins if they were indeed minted in the Ganges Valley, continued to be produced for a quarter century in the name of the displaced former ruler. In other words, the mints were not royal operations, but were in the hands of concession holders. It appears from Ruth's analysis that the two mints received royal charters three times. <coughs> from Gangeya Deva in the middle of the century, from Govinda Chandra in the early 12th century, and from Kutubinda Ibak in the name of Muhammad Salam in the late 12th century. Leading us to the question posed at the start, how are we to interpret these posthumous coins? We saw from examples elsewhere, the Maria Teresa Tollers, the Indian princely states, that there are two interrelated by separate major reasons to strike posthumous coins. Because the public demands them, or because the minters want to continue minting within their existing authorities. It's clear from the evidence so far presented that neither the Gangeya Deva nor the Gurubinda Chandra coins were dynastic. <clears throat> That's to say, produced only during the lifetime of the persons named on them. It's also clear that the large production quantities and broad distribution indicate a sustained and intensive program of minting that seems to have been largely immune to the vagaries of political ebb and flow. So is this a case of consumer preference? Did the users of the coin express a strong predilection for a tried and true coin type that they did not want to see changed in any noticeable manner? Was this a stubborn retention of old formats despite a changing political landscape? Did the market decide who would, what would be the form and function of the gold coinage? Was the preference of merchants the deciding factor? Or was this a case of defending the right to coin against political pressure and the winds of change? Did the mint operators issuing these coins cling to their permission to mint uh, granted by Gangeya Deva during the Kalachuri period, by Govinda Chandra during the Gahaga ascendancy, and finally by Mohammed bin Sam, i.e. 
Kutub al Aibak during the Gura descendancy, producing the same coin over generations despite a succession of new rulers. So was the minting privilege of the financiers the deciding factor? No answers, just questions. I leave you with these thoughts. Anybody wishing to wade in the question is welcome to contact me either by email or Facebook Messenger. And before leaving, I would like to acknowledge the help I've had in this problem from many, many, many people, too uh, numerous to mention. But these colleagues on this page and the institutions have been especially helpful. And uh, I'd like to thank them personally for being so helpful in carrying forward a difficult issue. Thank you. Thank you, John. As usual, very stimulating. Um, let me see if there are any questions. Yes, one. Michael, are you trying to ask a question? I am. Okay. I'm sorry, it's not uh, very important, but it's my fingers or my computer or something being compared. Um, here I am. The, uh, the question of why coins are struck, you know, involves uh, an awful lot of considerations. Uh, we, we've used the word customers here, but uh, the specific customers are of a mint are the people who bring metal to the mint and walk away with the coins that are made by the mint. Those might be kings, but they might also be ordinary people. I wonder if we've looked at these coins, for example, that John has just been discussing. I'm wondering, were these mints simply, uh, these mints were actually producing a commodity for ordinary use. They were not simply expressions of the ego of the kings. Uh, where was the gold coming from, for example? Was gold being mined out in those parts of India at any time? Or was the gold being deliberately imported for the purpose of making coins, which seems would, would indicate that uh, the motivation for having the coins was more, we need coins, let's go find some gold to mint them, then we have all this gold, let's turn them into coins so we can get rid of it. Uh, I, I think if we perhaps, I, I don't have any real, really uh, useful suggestions actually in your particular case, why these coins were struck. But uh, uh, I think it's easier to understand if we look at it more in simply pure commercial terms. People have gold or silver and they want to turn it into coin which is money, of course, and gold and silver are not. Uh, why do they want to do that? And then in this specific case, of course, there's gonna be different situations. The gold and the silver will be coming from different sources and they will be serving different functions once they come out of them. So that, that's only my contribution, which I think applies to a, a good extent also to um, uh, the previous papers as well, and in fact, any paper at all or any study at all that is numismatic, that we need to, we need to keep in mind these practical considerations, that it's not just a question of royal ego, uh, it's not just a question of nationalism of one form and one form of another, but it's a practical consideration. People have metal, they want to get rid of it, or rather turn it into money, and how do they do that? Um, I was thinking, in fact, in terms of the history of minting in Canada, uh, about which I happen to know something because of the wonderful pamphlet that the Mint issued 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. I, I've forgotten now how, how old it is. And I'm not going to say anything about Canada, but I think John knows exactly what I mean. It was this whole question of, does Canada need money and why? And uh, in fact, it, it sort of, not much of it boiled down to Canada's producing gold and silver. How can we make it into money in the most practical way? There were other considerations as well. 
She'll answer. It, it doesn't need, it's, it's not really a question. I'm sorry, you don't need to answer it. But I would like to know more about the circumstances in which these coins were produced in a practical way. Uh, where was the gold coming from and, and into whose hands did the coins go when they were minted? Yeah, well, thank you for raising it. These, they're important issues. Um, and that's always one of the first questions we ask when we look at a minting process. Why was it happening? Where was, where was the precious metal coming from? Um, I didn't get into that in the slideshow because there's, you know, a sure. very short this period of time. This is a critical question. But it is, it, it is an issue I'm thinking about. Um, the Geological Survey of India has been doing a lot more work lately with archaeologists. And uh, about 10, 15 years ago, they discovered uh, a huge group of ancient uh, gold workings just south of Varanasi on the, on the Sona River, uh, which they have published. So I'm trying to get more information on that. It may turn out that one of the reasons that this area consistently produced gold coinages was simply uh, the monetization of local gold. On the other hand, you've got very famous pilgrimage places with people coming from all over India, bringing wealth with them and bestowing it on temples. So. It, it, it's not a simple um, question, it's a complicated question. Can I say something about that? I, I'm, it's always struck me that um, merchants would rather not use coins um, because coins imply control by other people, um, the monetary system. And so what, why, why are they using coins is also a question that one has to ask, you know, because when, you, when you're not using coins, the merchants can have much better control of the value of the things he's paying out um, than if he's using coins, because coins are either manipulated by a state or by money changers. Um, so, you know, what's the, what's the advantage of having coins is, is also a... But what's the alternative, Joe? Sorry? What's the alternative? What? William? What, what, what are they supposed to use as a means of exchange, if not coins? I mean, are you arguing in favor of paper money? Or are you no, arguing... I'm saying that if you, if you want to make a payment of a certain amount of gold, um, it's uh, if, if you make it into coins, then you have to pay somebody to make it into coins. Um, and so you lose part of the value. So why would you bother? I'm sorry. Because your gold is worth more in the form of a coin than it is in the form of a lump of yellow metal. Reason in, in some contexts. I think that's the reason, very easy. So it means that there is a, an added value, right? And uh, that added value is added by the mint. And operation of the mint is this thus being paid on the expense of the same merchant. The so mint takes a cut. It would be complicated, right? The mint takes a cut. You know, you, you, when, when, when you're having coins made, metal made into coins, the mint takes advantage of it. Of course. No, so so who, you know if you know, going back to the these these posthumous coins, it's really interesting who is making them and where where are they circulating? You know, are are they being used? You know, do, do they prefer to keep those coins because um, that's what religious donations are generally made in, or is it because taxes are paid in them? Um, you know, I think one needs to ask. You know, why why that particular form of currency persists um, over such a long period of time. Well, Joe, there's also a, a cultural element to it. There's, hmm. there's no doubt the question of uh, minting, minting prerogative, minting um, uh, profits. Um, what is the form of payment system between uh, markets, uh, market participants, uh, etc.? 
But in this case, there's also a, a very strong cultural aspect, and that is the goddess Lakshmi and the representation of the goddess as a piece of gold. And quite often, even in archaeological context, when we get these coins, they're covered with red sindur, kumkum. And it's crystal clear that they had been used by some family at some time in, in worship. And most specifically at Lakshmi Puja, when businessmen close their books and pay off their debts. And um, the invocation to the goddess is made, offerings to the goddess to bring wealth in the coming year. She, she is herself the bestower of wealth and the bestower of prosperity. So we have to recognize as well, it's not just a simple matter of money of the realm, but uh, here was, here was a, a good, a religious and cultural good that people actively would want to own if only to, to assist the prosperity of, of their family and to aid in worship. So it's, it's not a simple matter. It's a, it's a very complex issue. Well, so the goddess was one of the customers. She demanded payment in uh, the, the, a certain kind of coin. Even she was an indirect customer of the Met, but that's what she wanted. <laughs> okay, well, we should move, we should move on, I'm afraid.